good though. All right, so if you can uh, open your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2. Uh, a little bit of my story. Uh, I did not start out in my church walk and my church life doing anything like what I just did or said. I started out in a very conservative, fundamentalist, cessationist Christian school. Uh, for those of you who don't know what either of those words mean, fundamentalist or cessationist, basically it means that the power of the Holy Spirit was relegated to the first century and it was not brought into our present day. So things like the prophetic, things like healing, tongues, whatever, whatever you want to call it, any of those things, that doesn't happen anymore. And realistically, what I was taught by a few different teachers was if you see something like that happening today, it's demonic. So that's what I really grew up in. That's not what I was taught at home, uh, but I spent just, the fact of the matter is, I spent more time at school with those Bible teachers than I did at home. So that was just the voice that was louder. So I never fully bought into it, but that's what I kind of grew up under. The, the beginning of my theological and biblical training started in that space. So when anybody would mention something like that, I would just kind of shove it off. I would be kind of skeptical, wouldn't know what to think. Uh, then fast forward to th 2010, my family starts coming here to the Rock of Roseville, and I get invited to go to this winter camp. Uh, I had n not met anybody in the youth group. I didn't know anybody, nothing. I was the pudgy, awkward kid that would sit in the back and didn't know people. So it was the spirit of God, really, I believe, that caused me to think like, yeah, I'll just go and I'll meet people and I'll make friends and that's how I'll get plugged in. Uh, that was not my personality. That was Jesus. So I go and basically everything that I was ever told didn't happen, wasn't for today, happened in the span of three days. I saw people get healed uh, beyond just, I think I have a headache and now it's gone. We're talking stuff like I have a torn MCL and I can't use my knee this way and now I can use my knee this way. Uh, it even followed us home from the camp, and I remember the night where we came in, and there was a guy who had a fractured collarbone, and he put up two x-rays on the screen. One was from just a few days before where it was fractured, and you can see the line. One was from after we prayed, a few days after we prayed, and it was completely mended and whole. I'm seeing that. I'm seeing people praying over people, and they know information about the person who they're praying for. They know information about their lives that there's no way they could know because they don't know that person. And I'm seeing, on top of that, I'm seeing all the sort of charismatic craziness you could think of. I, I remember my poor little Baptist self. I was in the front, which was weird in and of itself. I, I was in the front during worship on the first night. People start falling left and right next to me. And I'm looking around like, what in the world is going on? There's people shaking and all this sorts of crazy stuff. But what was interesting and sovereign about it was it wasn't just the quote unquote, few people who you, you guys know what I'm talking about when you know people who are like, okay, that's just so-and-so. Uh, this was the whole room. I'm talking the kids who got dragged there, the kids who were forced to go, the kids who were trying to sneak out, but were forced to go back inside. It was all of them. They were all getting words. They were all having encounter with the Holy Spirit. And I had a radical encounter with the love of God that changed my life and set me on a completely different trajectory. But what struck me about those encounters was for all the weirdness and all the craziness that was there, that expression of church, that expression of God was the most like the book of Acts I had ever seen in all my life going to church. It was the most like the biblical form of Christianity that I was reading about for so long. People were getting healed. God was no longer just a theological idea. He was real, he was powerful, and he actually cared. And he broke in, messed up my life in the best way, messed up the lives of the people around me. Those people who I was next to, who were rolling around on the floor and who I thought were crazy, that a few of those people were in my wedding. One of them was my best man. I'm still running with those people today. Why do I bring this up? Because I believe, and I'm going to say this frequently throughout the rest of the night, I believe that the story of Pentecost, which we're going to read here in just a moment, I believe that that story is not stagnant. It's not a dead story. It's a living invitation to encounter the Holy Spirit. 
It's not a stagnant story. The, the story of Pentecost is our history. It's our heritage. And it is a living invitation to encounter a God who's real and active and powerful. I'm feeling preachy tonight. <laughs> All right. So we're in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read several verses from that. Uh, it's a long chunk of, chunk of verses, but I'm going to just read through. I'm going to go kind of into the, uh, the background of what Pentecost was. Uh, if you didn't know, it was actually a Jewish holiday before Christians had anything to do with it. So we're going to talk about that for a little bit. But I'm going to read through a large chunk of Acts. And I'm doing that because as I'm talking, I'm believing that you're going to start to make connections and start to see things. And I'm going to just give room for the Holy Spirit to begin to highlight things to you as I speak. So, okay, we're good. (laughs) Acts chapter two, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in in their native language. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the residents of Mesopotamia, and a bunch of other long words I'm not going to read. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. They had too much of the good stuff, in other words. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this was what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. I'm going to take a break right there really quick to say everything you just saw me do in terms of ministry, you have access to because of this, what this verse is saying. The days are done and over where there's the one quote unquote anointed man of God who has all the gifts and all the ability. That's not what Jesus is into. That's never what he was into. That's never what he was about. Even when he was walking the earth, there were only a few months, maybe a couple years where the disciples were watching him heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse lepers. There was only a short amount of time where they were watching him and then he released them to do the same thing. So because of what Peter is saying, you guys all, because of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on Pentecost, you have access to everything that you saw me do, everything you've heard from any anointed man or woman of God, any miracle you've heard, any miracle you've wanted to try and step out in, you have access to because of what Peter's saying right here. Moving ahead to uh, verse 37 in chapter 2. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone from whom the Lord God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. How many of you guys know God can anoint weird? (laughs) There were people stumbling out of this upper room that were so full, so crazed with the Holy Spirit that they looked like they were drunk. A lot of us would see something like that happening in a church today and we would walk out. But because it's what God was doing, fruit came from it. 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom that day. Talk more about that in a second, but I just wanted to highlight that because I thought that was interesting. So as I mentioned before, Pentecost, Christians don't own that. It was Jewish before we got to it. Uh, The Hebrew word for Pentecost is Shavuot. Everybody say Shavuot. 
I can cross that repeat after me thing off of my preacher's checklist. First time, got it. So what this festival was about, it's called the Feast of Weeks because what God said in Exodus was he said, count for yourselves seven weeks after Passover so that you can basically have a harvest festival, have a harvest feast. So God commanded this. And it it was for celebrating, thanking God for the harvest that he was bringing. What I found was interesting as I was researching this passage, researching the holiday, was that rabbis actually attached another meaning to it. Rabbis came in with their tradition and then they said, so pass, not Passover, so Shavuot, Pentecost is not just about uh, thanking God for the harvest. It's actually also about thanking God for the giving of the Torah, So I want to draw some parallels here because how many of you guys have started to kind of notice the pattern that there's something in the Old Testament and then a parallel kind of shows up in the New Testament. It's just way cooler. So in the New Testament, at Pentecost, when they're celebrating the giving of the law, it's no longer God just giving, hey, these are rules and regulations. God gives himself. He gives his spirit to his people. He now not only gives the regulation, he gives the power to actually perform and do what he's asked you to do. Grace empowers what it asks of you. That's what was released on Pentecost. The other thing, if you're not so sure about that connection, that really blew my mind in terms of, again, the connection, was that the rabbi said that at Mount Sinai, every Israelite heard the voice of God giving the Ten Commandments, and they all heard it, and they all understood it. It was communicated in a way they could understood. Fast forward to Pentecost, the gift of tongues is released, People from all over the area speaking all sorts of different native languages come together and they're asking themselves, why can we all hear these Galileans speaking about the mighty, powerful deeds of God? God gave something much better than the law at Pentecost. He gave himself. He gave his spirit. And I want to highlight something else too. In John 16, I believe, Jesus comes to the disciples and says, it's actually better for you that I leave so that I can send the Holy Spirit. It is actually better for you that I leave so that I can send the promise of my father. I think a lot of times we're sitting around just wishing, man, I wish Jesus would come fix my problems for me. When he's saying, no, I released the Holy Spirit to you. I want to fix your problem through you, not for you. Sometimes I feel like we don't understand the value of what we have. The son of God, Jesus, while he was on the earth, for all the things he was doing, all the miracles, all the signs and wonders, all the people he was teaching, the movement he was leading, he saw all of that, had that whole perspective and said, you know what? It's actually better if I leave because of what's coming after me. That's what lives in you. That's what you're called to. That's what was given to you. Another parallel. Again, this one completely blew my mind as well. Uh, If you ever like getting your mind blown, just kind of study the Bible. Uh, And if if you're able to kind of get over your own familiarity with it, you'll read some things that actually kind of shock you. And you'll see some parallels that actually tweak your brain a little bit. As I was researching and as I was thinking, uh, the other parallel, which may surprise you, for Pentecost is actually the Tower of Babel. Some of you guys are starting to make the connections. I kind of heard that. I heard the, heard the cogs working. So at Babel, what we have is we have God. He's given his command. He's given his mission. He's declared what that is. He said, fill the earth and subdue it. But what does man decide to do? we gather up in one big group and all speak the same language and decide we're not going to do that. We're actually going to congregate in one area. So because of that, God sees that and he says, okay, this is not what needs to be happening right now. His power comes down. He confuses their language and he spreads them out. Fast forward to Pentecost. What happens? 
Jesus declares his mission in Acts 1.8. You are going to be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, but wait in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. We submit to the mission. Our forefathers in the faith submit to the mission. The power still comes down. It's released, but this time, instead of being scattered, they're empowered. And I'm going to propose this thought to you. Sometimes the Holy Spirit and what people call the Holy Spirit working on them, in them, through them can be scary. It can be offensive. It can be scary and it can be offensive. But what I'm going to say is this, and what I see in the Bible is this. And even what I see across the earth, I get privileged to walk through tons of different places, tons of different churches and talk to people. God's on the move, guys. Uh, He really is. Across the whole earth, people are getting healed. Revival is happening. It's happening. And the the more prophetic people I talk to, people who've really got a track record of hearing the heart of God for cities, for nations, for things like that, they're all in agreement that there's something bigger coming. There's a harvest of souls that's coming. And what I'm going to say is this. The power of God is going to come one way or another, and it's up to you whether you get offended or you get empowered in that moment. The power of God is coming one way or another, and it's up to you whether or not you get offended and scattered or you get to be a part of what God's doing. Jesus is really not afraid to offend us if we're thinking incorrectly. I'll say that too. Uh, He has never been afraid of challenging my wrong mindsets, especially about who he is. Because realistically, if we think about this, heaven is going to be spent staring into the face of Jesus, staring into the face of true beauty, and we're going to be getting revelation constantly about who he is. A lot of heaven is going to be you recognizing that you were wrong about what you thought about him. (laughs) And even, even to kind of tack onto that, the Bible says that eternity, eternal life is to know the Son of God. You started knowing the son of God when you said yes to him. Eternal life doesn't start when you die. Eternal life started right now. So get used to being wrong. <laughs> I've, uh, it's humbling, but you didn't need your pride anyway. That's what I've come to, uh, come to realize. <laughs> Again, God anoints weird stuff. Uh, We have these apostles stumbling out of an upper room looking like they're completely wasted, like completely gone, enough to the point where people decided it was a good idea to make fun of them. 3,000 people get saved. I was reading through this passage, reading through this passage, thinking about this point, and I was even, uh, I was reminded of Ryan, who's sitting in the front row. He has this story that he tells where he was uh, being missional to a few friends uh, at Oakmont High School back when he was attending there. And he was driving one of them home from theater practice and the Holy Spirit whispers to him and says, tell him he's not an awkward duck. Tell him he's not an awkward duck. Ryan, because he's amazing and obedient, kind of closes his eyes and says it so that he can't see what the guy's, how the guy reacts. He says it and he just hears weeping. He says it, and the guy starts weeping. Weird doesn't necessarily mean bad. If God's inspiring weird, it will release some crazy stuff because of the faith that it takes to bridge that gap. I'm going to say this, too. If the God that you worship never does anything powerful or weird, I would question how well you know him. If he never does anything weird, never offends you, never makes you uncomfortable, never says anything that makes you mad, then there's an invitation for more for you tonight. I've lived on that neat and proper, God fits inside of my perfect religious box side of Christianity before, and it was death to me. I grew, I grew up under that thing. I thought God hated me. I thought he didn't care. I will pursue all the weird stuff if God is in it, if it means I don't have to go back to that. Some of you guys are thinking, well, what about the middle ground where I like don't have to stop it? <laughs> stop. <laughs> we kid ourselves sometimes thinking that there's a middle ground with God. He didn't want part of you. He wanted all of you. He didn't want part of your obedience. He wanted all of it. 
That doesn't mean I'm not standing up here saying I'm perfect, saying I've got it. I've screwed up so many times. (laughs) But I know who I'm running after, and I know what I'm contending for. And I'm not going to stop until it happens. I think there's some people in the room who will join me in that. I'll say this along the same lines, too, because the Lord spoke this really clear, really clearly to me. 1 Corinthians 16, 7 talks about how when we said yes to Jesus, we became one spirit with him. It was more than just, okay, you're a part of this weird religious family now. You call people you don't know, brother and sister, and amen, bless, bless the Lord, brother, I guess. Like, it, more than that, more than just being able to actually call him father, you became one spirit with him. That's not me adding some sort of tricky interpretation on top of it. You can read it, 1 Corinthians 16, 7, or said that, said that right? 6, 17, flip that. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 it says, you became one spirit with him. So if there's a part of you that's afraid of engaging with Holy Spirit because of what you've seen other people call the move of God, what you've seen other people call the move of the Holy Spirit, getting knocked on the floor, speaking in tongues. Hey, I'm not going to deny that Pentecostals and Charismatics are weird. We're weird people. I will fully own up to that. We do weird stuff. But again, God can anoint weird. God will anoint weird, and God often does anoint weird. But if you're going to not engage with the power of the Holy Spirit, because you're afraid of what will happen, that's not maturity. We think it's maturity. We think it's balance to avoid that, to disengage with that. So if, he, if you are one spirit with him, that's a part of yourself that you're choosing to ignore. That's a part of who you are that you're choosing to put in the closet, put in the box and say no to. In any other arena of life, when we have a part of ourselves that we ignore, keep in a box and say no to because it makes us uncomfortable, we don't call that wisdom or maturity. We call that stunted growth and it's not healthy. That's good news, guys. (laughs) There's more for you. And the great part is, is if we all say yes to this thing, there's going to be a bunch of crazy people next to you who are probably going to look weirder than you do. So let that comfort you. (laughs) Why do I say that? Because why do I talk about all this? Ultimately, what I'm calling us to and what Pentecost is about, it's an invitation to engage with Holy Spirit in your everyday life. Honestly, if you're bored with your life and you're bored with Christianity, That has more to do with you than with him. I have had the most fun in my entire life by risking looking like an idiot and saying yes to the power of God. I am 24 years old for crying out loud. And I've been able to travel all over the earth and see God heal people of cancer, see him release people who have been in emotional bondage for years. There is nothing that beats that. There is nothing that beats that. And it's not because I'm some weird, special, hyper-anointed person. I'm just a son of God that said yes. Will you say yes? That's the question that Pentecost asks. Again, it's not a dead story. It's not a stagnant story. It's a living invitation for you to engage with the power of the Holy Spirit. And even to tack onto that, how many of you guys want to be missional? How many of you guys are trying to see the, the Lord affect people in your life, whether it's family members, coworkers, Here's the thing, in Acts 1.8, and even before that in Luke, Jesus said, okay, this is my plan, this is what the mission's going to look like, but he said, don't do anything, don't move until you are clothed with power from on high. If you're trying to do mission, but ignoring and holding off the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're doing it backwards. There is so much more for us, Rock of Roseville. There is so much more. And I'm contending for that more to come even tonight and to come tomorrow. If somebody can come to the keys really quick. (sighs) There's more. (laughs) Like I can keep repeating that and I will probably get more excited each time I say that. The beautiful part of God is there's no end to him. There's no end to him. There's no end to the creativity, the power of the Holy Spirit. I was just at this conference just a few days ago. 
I was talking, this man was talking up front. I've gotten to talk with him personally, so I know he's not absolutely crazy. He's crazy about Jesus. But he was talking about, again, if we're thinking about engaging with the power of the Holy Spirit, he's waking up consistently in the morning with all these thoughts and weird, like, patterns and things about genetics. And he's like, okay, this is random, but I believe God speaks to us while we sleep. That's all throughout the Bible. Don't need to search too hard for that. So he sends it to some people that he knows at a local university about, you know, am I, what is this? Like, what's going on? The person instantaneously replies, where did you get your PhD in genetics? He's like, I I don't have a PhD in genetics. Okay, where'd you get your master's degree? I don't have a master's degree. Where did you study science? I went to Bible college. If nothing else, I want this to stir up hunger in you guys. There's more. And the beautiful thing about it is, even if you've already said yes to the power of the Holy Spirit, you've already begun to engage with it. Acts 4. Acts 4 is Pentecost 2.0. A lot of times we get stuck in our theologies. We get stuck in our ideas about, I, I got baptized once. I speak in tongues already. I, like, I think I'm good. I think I did it. Acts 4 is weeks and months, probably even years removed from Pentecost, and the almost exact same thing happens. The room is shaken. They say, Lord, take note of their threats. They've been persecuted at this point. Take note of their threats and grant it to your servants with all boldness to preach the word, to preach the gospel as you, he- as you stretch out your hand to heal with signs and wonders. The room gets shaken. They get filled with the Holy Spirit again. They get sent out. The church grows again. So what I want to ask you guys, Rock of Roseville, do you want more? Do you want to engage with the power of the Holy Spirit? Great thing is there's an opportunity to do it tomorrow night. (laughs) Why don't you stand up? Holy Spirit, come. So the call I want to give tonight is simple. If you want more of the Holy Spirit, if you want to see his power working in your life, if you're ready to let go of control, doesn't mean you let go of wisdom, but you let go of your own control of your life to invite the Holy Spirit to move in power in you, I want you to come forward. Some of you have actually felt Holy Spirit working on you, even while I was speaking. You felt something that felt like fire in your hands, or you felt like a weight come on you. You felt heat. Some of you just felt the tug in your heart. As I've been talking about this, something inside of you just felt like it was exploding. The Lord wants to touch you tonight. So I want you to just stick your hands out in front of you like you're going to receive a gift, whatever you need to do to relax and put yourself in a position to receive. Prayer team, if you can look around and start finding people to lay hands on. Holy Spirit, right now, we just invite you to come. We invite your power, Holy Spirit. So Jesus, we just ask for more of you right now, God. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to come. We thank you, Jesus. Jesus.